Hello, good afternoon. So today we'll be discussing the second part of Chapter 4, Hemodynamic Disorders, Thromboembolic Disease, and Shock. So remember, during the first part, we discussed that in hemostasis, if there is excessive clotting, there would be thrombosis and possible embolism. And if there is inadequate blood clotting, there will be hemorrhage. So let's first talk about hemorrhagic disorders. So by now you would know that hemorrhagic disorders can either be due to primary or secondary defects in vessel walls, platelets, or coagulation factors, and the presentation of these disorders would vary widely. Some disorders will just show you subtle bleeding, just like your von Willebrand disease, or if a patient has aspirin intake or uremia, to intermediate bleeding, including your hemophilias, to very massive rapid bleeding due to, uh, due to rupture of your aorta or your heart. So let's start with the defects of primary hemostasis, which include either quantitative platelet defects or qualitative platelet, platelet defects. So remember, again, if we're talking about primary hemostasis, we're talking here about platelets since it culminates in the formation of your platelet plug. So definitely, the platelets can either have quantitative problems, which in medical terms, if you have low platelet count in your laboratory result, that would indicate thrombocytopenia. So it could have quantitative problems or qualitative defects or other conditions Included here would be von Willebrand disease, Bernard Soder syndrome, and Glanzmann thrombastinia. So these disorders would often present with small beads in skin or mucosal membranes, which are clinically seen as the small pinpoint 1 to 2 millimeter hemorrhages called your petechiae. And if they're already larger, like more than or equal to 3 millimeters, they are referred to as purpura. So mucosal bleeding in primary hemostasis defects may also present as uh, epistaxis, gastrointestinal bleeding, or ex excessive menstruation. And remember, if there is excessive menstruation, that can lead to what? It can lead to anemia. Specifically, what kind of anemia do you think? Your iron uh, deficiency anemia. For secondary hemostasis defects or coagulation factor defects, diseases under this category often present with bleeds in soft tissues or joints. And take note that bleeding into these joints, which is clinically referred to as hamarthrosis, following minor trauma is particularly characteristic of what condition, do you think? Of hemophilia. So therefore, if you have patients with history of recurrent bleeding into their joints and who came in due to the same um, condition, then you can suspect hemophilia on that patient. So in contrast to chronic external blood loss as seen in gastrointestinal or menstrual bleeding, since the red blood cells are retained in the tissues or body cavities, the iron content tends to be recovered and recycled for use in hemoglobin synthesis. Therefore, if it is recovered and recycled, these patients may not exhibit iron deficiency anemia despite chronic bleeding. So for generalized defects involving small vessels, this would often present with palpable purpura and ecchymosis, which are larger hemorrhages about one to two centimeters in size. Both of them here, the volume of extravasated blood may be large enough to create a palpable mass of blood known as hematoma. So these findings are characteristic of systemic disorders such as vasculitis or diseases that induce vessel fragility as seen in amyloidosis or in scurvy, which is what? The lack or due to what vitamin deficiency? Due to vitamin C deficiency. The next lesson that we will learn is something that happens if there is excessive clotting, and that is your thrombosis. Now, to properly understand thrombosis, we need to first recognize the factors that predispose an individual to thrombus formation, and that is implicitly presented by the Virchow triad. 
wherein the primary abnormalities are identified as endothelial injury, abnormal blood flow, and hypercoagulability of the blood. Again, virtual triad will include endothelial injury, abnormal blood flow, and hypercoagulability. So the first abnormality in virtual triad which will promote thrombosis would include endothelial injury. Obviously, severe endothelial injury may trigger thrombosis by exposing von Willebrand factor and tissue factor. So again, with endothelial injury, the pendulum would swing to a more thrombotic state, which includes procoagulant changes and antifibrinolytic changes. So when we say procoagulant changes, there is downregulation of expression of your thrombomodulin, your protein C, and your tissue factor protein inhibitor, or TFPI. While your antifibrinolytic changes would contribute to the secretion of plasminogen activator inhibitors, or your PAIS, and downregulation of expression of your tissue plasminogen activator, or your TPA. So if you remember physiology, you have learned that normal blood flow is a laminar blood flow, meaning that the cellular elements such as your platelets, your RBCs, are flowing centrally in the vessel lumen, and these are separated from the endothelium by a slower moving layer of your plasma. So pathologic alterations in normal blood flow can come in two forms. So as you can see for this slide, just remember that turbulence would cause endothelial injury which can result in arterial thrombi, while stasis would contribute to the formation of venous thrombi due to the sluggish blood flow of the venous circulation. Again, if there is turbulence, it will cause endothelial injury resulting in arterial thrombi, while stasis would contribute to the formation of your venous thrombi due to sluggish blood flow. Your turbulence and stasis, therefore, will promote endothelial activation, disrupt laminar flow, and prevent washout and dilution of activated clotting factors. So the third component of your virtual triad is hypercoagulability. So this refers to an abnormally high tendency of the blood to clot caused by alterations in coagulation factors. So hypercoagulability plays a particularly important role in venous thrombosis and can be divided into primary, which is genetic, or secondary, which is acquired disorder, in which the latter are frequently multifactorial. Let's now discuss individual states that are hypercoagulable. So first of them would be your factor 5 laden. This is an autosomal dominant disorder and is due to point mutations in factor 5 where arginine is su substituted by glutamine. Again, this is where arginine is substituted by glutamine. So this mutation then renders factor 5 resistant to cleavage and inactivation by activated protein C. As a result, an important antithrombotic counterregulatory pathway is lost. So remember that arginine is substituted by glutamine in factor 5 laden. Like factor 5 laden, prothrombin gene mutation is also more common in Caucasians. And again, this is due to a point mutation in the prothrombin gene at base pair number 20210, this time resulting in a guanine to adenine substitution. Again, it will result to a guanine to adenine substitution. So this will lead to elevated prothrombin levels where heterozygotes experience a threefold increased risk for venous thrombosis. Next condition that we will discuss is HIT syndrome or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So this is a serious potentially life-threatening disorder that occurs following administration of unfractionated heparin or less frequently low molecular weight heparin preparations. So this will result from the formation of antibodies against heparin platelet factor 4 complexes on platelet surfaces, as well as complexes of heparin-like molecules and PF4-like proteins on endothelial cells. Now, if you recall, PF4 protein is normally found in platelet alpha granules, 
and is one of the factors released after platelet activation. So the released PF4 binds to heparin and undergoes a conformational change that results in the formation of a neoantigen against which antib an antibodies that are IgG are formed. So this PF4 IgG immune complex then attaches to and cross-links the FC receptors on the platelet surface which leads to platelet activation and aggregation. And then the activation will result in the release of more PF4 and the cycle continues. So again, if you are asked what kind of hit antibodies are they, they are not IgE, not IgA, not IgD, but they are IgG antibodies. Next condition is your APS or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So this is an autoimmune disorder characterized by venous or arterial thrombosis or pregnancy complications. And this can come in the form of recurrent miscarriages, unexplained fetal death, and premature birth. So if you're already in your clinics and you have a patient in OBGYN who came in because of another miscarriage and she has a history of previous miscarriages, so you need to consider this diagnosis. So it is typically associated with the presence of one or more antiphospholipid autoantibodies. So remember these antibodies. So these should be met. So more than or equal to one antiphospholipid autoantibodies, including your anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies, anti-cardiolipin antibodies, and your lupus anticoagulant. Your APS will have a varied clinical manifestation and will include recurrent thrombosis, repeated miscarriages as what I've mentioned before, cardiac valve vegetation, stroke, renovascular hypertension, and thrombocytopenia. Again, diagnosis is based on characteristic clinical features and serology. So remember those autoantibodies that I mentioned a while ago. So still on the topic of thrombi, we now know that these can develop anywhere in the cardiovascular system and they may vary in size and shape depending on the involved site and the underlying cause. So in autopsy or in forensics, we usually encounter different clots in the body of uh, post-mortem examinations. So there is what we call anti-mortem clot and post-mortem clot. So why do we need to differentiate the two? When we say anti-mortem clot, this is a clot that is formed before the patient died. And when we say post-mortem clot, this would be the clot that is formed after the patient died. So the clues to the answer whether the patient died due to this clot or is the clot not related to the death of the patient will be answered by identifying if it is anti-mortem or post-mortem clot. So it has a characteristic um, gross and microscopic appearance. So if you can see in the picture, the anti-mortem clot are adherent to the vessel wall due to prior endothelial activation because again, the patient is still alive during the formation of that clot. And these may or may not fit their vascular contours depending on their propagation. While your post-mortem clots, due to the lack of blood flow, will take the shape of the vessel they're stuck in. And these are easily removed due to the lack of adherence to the underlying intact endothelium. Also, your post-mortem clot characteristically have a gelatinous appearance with a yellow upper portion and dark red dependent portion described as chicken fat over currant jelly. And this is due to the gravitational separation of your red blood cells which will settle at the bottom from the plasma that is seen at the top. Again, chicken fat over currant jelly. Microscopically, anti-mortem clots have these laminations or lines of ZAN signifying that a thrombus has formed during active blood flow. So these laminations would translate to alternating pale and um, darker areas wherein your pale areas are composed of fibrin and platelets and darker areas composed of red blood cells. So this is just a picture showing you a clear view on the dark and pale areas, alternating dark and pale areas consisting of RBCs and fibrin and platelets. Compared to your post-mortem clot that there, where there are no lines of sand, where they are just bland and non-laminated.
Now, this table will illustrate the differences between arterial or cardiac thrombi versus your venous thrombi. So, both types can be occlusive, but remember that arterial or cardiac thrombi usually begin at the sites of turbulence or endothelial injury due to high stress. And this is commonly seen as the cases observed in your coronary, cerebral, and femoral arteries in decreasing, in decreasing frequency. Again, in decreasing frequency, you have your coronary arteries, cerebral arteries, and femoral arteries. Whereas your venous thrombi would start at sites of stasis and they are usually found in the veins of lower extremities. So common causes of your arterial and cardiac thrombosis would include your atherosclerosis, aortic aneurysm, and myocardial infarction wherein you call it as a cardiac mural thrombi. So the sites of embolization can include the brain, the kidneys, and the spleen. As mentioned earlier, most venous thrombi would occur in the superficial or deep veins of the leg. So superficial venous thrombi occur in the saphenous vein in the setting of your varicosities. In contrast, deep vein thrombosis, which is typically found in popliteal, femoral, and iliac veins, is considered more concerning because these thrombi can embolize to the lungs and give rise to pulmonary infarction. So to make things worse, DVT patients are asymptomatic in half of the cases, which makes diagnosis of DVT and prevention of pulmonary embolism all the more difficult. So regardless of the type of vessel involved, if patient survives the initial thrombosis in the ensuing days to weeks, these thrombi undergo some combination of the following major events. So there may be dissolution of the thrombus, which is the result of fibrinolysis, that can lead to rapid shrinkage and total disappearance, especially of those recent smaller thrombi. In older thrombi, however, this may not be the case due to excessive fibrin deposition and cross-linking which renders them more resistant to lysis. So next, we need to discuss also DIC or Disseminated Intravascular Coagulation. So this is also known as consumptive coagulopathy. So this is a widespread thrombosis within the microcirculation. But take note that this is not a specific disease but a complication of several conditions associated with systemic activation of thrombin. So this would include your sepsis, malignancy, massive tissue injury, and obstetric complications and many more. So here there is consumption of platelets, platelets and coagulation factors and activation of fibrinolysis. So the diagnosis would be using your D-dimer assay. Remember that, D-I-C, D-dimer assay, also known as your com consumptive coagulopathy. So now let's go to embolism. So when we say embolus, it is a detached intravascular solid liquid of gaseous mass that is carried by the blood from its point of origin to a distant site where it often causes tissue dysfunction or infarction. So first, let's discuss pulmonary embolism as being the most common form of thromboembolic disease. So it is somewhat more common in males than in females. So as discussed before, your pulmonary embolism originates from leg DVT in around more than 95% of cases. Hence, the risk factors for your pulmonary embolism and DVT are the same. So just the same as your DVT, up to 80% of pulmonary embolism are clinically silent or asymptomatic because they are really small. And about 20% of individuals with pulmonary embolism actually die before or shortly after a diagnosis is made due to the lack of clinical prodrome. So the pathophysiology would just be a, uh, a fragmented thrombi from your DVT carried through progressively larger veins and to the right side of the heart before slamming into the pulmonary arterial vasculature. So this is just a gross picture of a saddle embolus. So that is a large embolus in the main pulmonary artery. Here it is lodged right smack at the bifurcation of the main pulmonary artery and just based on the size looking at it and its apparent total occlusion of the artery, sudden death is likely outcome for this particular patient. Your pulmonary embolism will have different consequences from just pulmonary hypertension and infarction to 
sudden death. Now let's go to systemic thromboembolism where the most common origin arises from intracardiac neural thrombi, about 80%. And the majority of this is associated with left ventricular wall infarcts and some with left atrial dilation and fibrillation. In contrast to venous thrombi, or emboli rather, where the vast majority lodges in the, in the lung, your arterial emboli can lodge in tissues or organs perfused by the aorta downstream where in the point of the arrest depends on the source and the relative amount of blood flow the tissue receives so most commonly these lodge in the lower extremities or the brain and the general outcome is of course tissue infarction next we have fat embolism which is the presence of fat globules sometimes with associated hematopoietic bone marrow in the vascular vasculature so this would be due to fracture of long bones, soft tissue trauma, and your birth. Now when we say fat embolism syndrome, it is a term applied to the minority of patients who become symptomatic after injury. And it is characterized by pulmonary insufficiency, neurologic symptoms, thrombocytopenia, and anemia. So the syndrome can be fatal in a, up to a 15% of cases and cases and that's why it's important that we diagnose it early in the course. So the pathogenesis of fat embolism syndrome involves both mechanical obstruction and biochemical injury. Next we have air embol embolism which occurs when there is communication between the vasculature and outside air and a negative pressure gradient that sucks in the air. So this happens during chest wall injuries or endovascular and interventional procedures as well as during mecha mechanical ventilation. So I think you already have learned this during your uh, lesson in physiology where in there, there is what we call decompression sickness. If in acute forms there are bends and chokes, in chronic form that is your case and disease. Next is your amniotic fluid embolism which is an ominous complication of labor and the immediate postpartum period and is known to be the fifth most common cause of mortality, maternal mortality worldwide. And even if the mother survives, majority would still suffer permanent neurologic deficit. So it, it is characterized by an onset of uh, severe dyspnea, cyanosis, and shock followed by neurologic impairment would, that would range from just a simple headache two seizures and coma and by DIC. So an autopsy, classic findings would include the presence of squamous cells shed from fe uh, fetal skin, lanugo hair, fat from vernis cachosa, and mucin derived from the fetal respiratory or GI tract. And these are all lodged in the maternal pulmonary vasculature. So if you can see the photo here, we are looking at the maternal pulmonary vessels occluded with these eosinophilic laminated material which are basically fetal squamous cells that were able to travel through ruptured uterine veins and into the maternal circulation and finally lodging into the small vessels of the mother's lungs. Next, we will be discussing infarction. Infarction is an ischemic tissue necrosis caused by occlusion of either the arterial supply or the venous drainage. And as repeatedly mentioned, arterial thrombosis or arterial embolism underlies the vast majority of infarctions. Although venous thrombosis can cause infarction, the more common outcome is just congestion. In this setting, bypass channels rapidly open and permit vascular outflow, which then improves arterial inflow. So infarcts caused by venous thrombosis are thus more likely in organs with single efferent vein like your testis and ovary. Now the effects of vascular occlusion can vary greatly from very subtle defects to tissue dysfunction, necrosis, or overt infarction. So generally there are four var variables that influence the outcome of vascular occlusion. So that will include the anatomy of vascular supply, the rate of occlusion, tissue vulnerability to hypoxia, and hypoxemia. So first is anatomy of vascular supply. So definitely, the availability of an alternative blood supply is the most important determinant of whether vessel occlusion will cause tissue damage, which means that organs or areas with at least dual blood supply are far more resistant 
to infarction than those with an arterial circulation, such as your um, kidneys and your spleen. Next is the rate of occlusion, wherein slow developing occlusions are less likely to cause infarction. And why? It's because they provide time for the development of collateral pathways of perfusion. Third is tissue vulnerability to hypoxia. Now remember that different cells in your body will have different vulnerabilities to hypoxia. For example, our neurons undergo irreversible damage when blood supply is cut off for as little as 3 to 4 minutes, while your myocardial cells can withstand hypoxia a little longer but also die after 20 to 30 minutes. In contrast, your fibroblasts within myocardium will remain viable even after how many hours of ischemia. So that's why when a patient will have myocardial infarction, you would see that there would be coagulative necrosis of the myocardial cells, but fibroblasts will tend to remain, and they even proliferate to form a scar if the patient survives. And lastly, hypoxemia or low blood oxygen content, regardless of the cause, increases both the likelihood of and extent of infarction. Now, infarcts are classified according to color and the presence or absence of infection. So, they can either be red or hemorrhagic, as you can see here in the picture, or white or anemic, and it may be septic if with concurrent infection, or bland, bland if it's relatively sterile. So, let's start with uh, red infarct. So, these are the following tissues that are prone to having red infarct. So, in loose and spongy tissues like the lung, in tissues with dual circulations, in tissues previously congested by sluggish venal outflow, and those tissues where flow is reestablished to a site of previous arterial occlusion and necrosis. Your white infarcts, on the other hand, occur with arterial occlusions in solid organs with an arterial occlusion, such as your heart, spleen, and kidney, and where there are where the high tissue density would limit the seepage of blood from adjoining capillary beds into the necrotic area. Now, regardless of the color, both types of infarcts tend to be wedge-shaped with the occluded vessel at the apex of the wedge and the periphery of the organ forming the wider base. And this is so because, again, the more distal the cells to the blood supply, the earlier and more severe the infarction. Now, the dominant histologic characteristic of infarction is ischemic coagulative necrosis, except in the CNS, where infarction results in what type of necrosis? In liquefactive necrosis. Septic infarctions occur when infected cardiac valve vegetations emboli, such as what happens in infective endocarditis, or when microbes seed necrotic tissue, which is typically seen in infarctions of the intestine, which normally contain enteric bacteria. Now, let's go to the last part of this chapter, which is shock. So, shock is a state of circulatory failure that impairs tissue perfusion and leads to cellular hypoxia. Shock can be categorized into five main groups, wherein the first three in this table are or represent the majority. So, we have cardiogenic shock, which results from low cardiac output due to myocardial pump failure. Next is hypovolemic shock which results from low cardiac output due to low blood volume. So this can occur during massive hemorrhage or fluid loss from severe burns or even severe diarrhea. Third common would be your shock associated with systemic inflammation which is actually composed of distinct but interrelated and somewhat overlapping conditions namely your sepsis, septic shock and and the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So later on, we will, we will know how do we classify a patient as having SIRS. Now, less commonly, we also have a shock that can occur in the setting of spinal cord injury, which is your neurogenic shock, or an IgE-mediated hypersensitivity reaction, your anaphylactic shock, which is what type of hypersensitivity? Your type 1 hypersensitivity. So in both of these shock forms, acute vasodilation leads to hypotension and tissue hypoperfusion. So this slide will show you that in order to classify the patient as having sepsis, there should be a focus of infection plus 
your SIRS or SIRS, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. When we say SIRS, it must satisfy at least two of the four criteria. So remember the criteria. Number one, temperature should be less than 36 degrees Celsius or more than 38 degrees Celsius. Heart rate should be more than 90 beats per minute. RR of more than 20 cycles per minute or arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide of less than 32. WBC count should be four th less than 4,000 or more than equal 12,000 or having more than 10% blast bands. Again, we must be able to satisfy two out of four of those mentioned before we can classify it as having systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Now, the pathogenesis of septic shock is quite complex and involves incompletely understood processes. So I would like to uh, you to read more on this on our textbook as I would like to emphasize more on the stages of your shock. Now, shock is a progressive disorder with failure of multiple organs leading to death if the underlying problems are not corrected. So, seen in the slide would be your stage, stages of shock. So, you have non-progressive stage, progressive stage, and irreversible stage. In the initial non-progressive stage, reflex compensatory mechanisms are activated to sufficiently maintain cardiac output and blood pressure. Therefore, there is still maintenance of vital organ perfusion. If you go to the next stage or progressive stage here, your vital organs will begin to fail. And on the last stage, which is the irre irreversible stage, the end result would be death because there is already lysosomal enzyme leakage, myocardial contractile functions would worsen, bacteremic shock may be superimposed, and there would be renal failure. The cellular and tissue effects of shock are essentially those of hypoxic injury and are caused by a combination of hypoperfusion and microvascular thrombosis. And although any organ can be affected, so the, the brain, heart, kidneys, adrenals, and GAT are most commonly involved. The clinical manifestations of shock depend on the precipitating insult. So in hypovolemic shock and cardiogenic shock, the patient may experience hypotension, weak and rapid pulse, tachypnea, and cool, clammy cyanotic skin. While in patients with septic shock, the patient may experience warm and flushed skin with signs and symptoms of infection. Now in terms of prognosis, it will vary with the origin of shock and its duration, such that more than 90% of young Otherwise, healthy patients with hypovolemic shock survive with appropriate management, but those suffering from septic or cardiogenic shock are associated with substantially poorer outcomes, even with the best therapeutic interventions. But the one thing is for sure with your um, septic shock or in shock in general, that it, the, the thing is that you should be able to know or identify the precipitating insult to better manage your patient. Thank you so much for listening. This would conclude the second part of hemodynamics. I do hope that you were able to learn a lot. So you study hard and do well in your examinations. Thank you.